So, hi, welcome. Uh, which it's a, it's a very new series for us uh, called Southwest Science Chats. Um, so we're launching this new for 2024, and today we're delighted to be joined um, by Professor Tim Dodwell from DigiLab. He is the C, uh, the Chief Technical Officer um, at DigiLab and one of the co-founders. Um, so. Tim, thank you so much for joining us this evening for the very first uh, episode, I suppose, in the series. I feel very privileged. Thank you. So, good. Thank you. Oh, we're really glad to, to speak to you. So um, I guess we to, to give you a bit of background as to why we set up this discussion. Um, so if you remember back to May last year, we had a really interesting chat all about AI uh, with uh, Michelle Beger and Roger Taylor. Uh, look on our website if you'd like to, to catch up on those. Um, that was really interesting about the kind of wider implications of, of AI in society. Um, and Michelle has now completed her PhD. Congratulations, Michelle. Um, and Michelle works uh, for DigiLab. So we're really pleased that um, that we're able to, to set up this chat. And, and we want to find out a lot more about what DigiLab do. So uh, DigiLab, I mean, Tim is going to give us a bit of a, 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 an overview. Um, but uh, we're, we're just really interested in the way that DigiLab operates as a tech company based in Exeter, which we think is really progressive um, in the way that they run the, their organization. Plus, they're doing really cool stuff in AI that uh, I want to get the nerdy details about. So, um, so yeah, I guess let's get started. Um, all the way through, please do share your... Um, your responses. If you have any questions for Tim, uh, I believe we should be streaming live to LinkedIn and to YouTube. So, um, so please do tune in. Um, and of course, you know, we can, we can take any questions. If you were to email them to us or, or anything else, you can do that at info at .org. Um, but yeah, pop them in the chat because we want to get a bit of a discussion going here because, uh, otherwise just I'll be asking all my questions and I've got plenty. Um, but yeah, I'd like to hear what you, what you'd like to know. And so would Tim. So, uh, so I guess let's get started, Tim. I've got a few questions, um, to get us starting off. Maybe, um, you could tell us a little bit about your career path and how you came to found DigiLab. A uh, really nice question. Uh, it's been uh, not too long a story. Um, so I, my background is as a mathematician. So I was really interested in uh, modeling. Uh, so um, about how you build mathematical models to describe systems, either engineering systems, uh, societal systems, physical systems, um, and really believed in the power of maths. Uh, so I did a PhD in that area and sort of analyzing mathematical methods and modeling. Um, and so when I finished my PhD, I, um, I was moving into academia, so I was going to become a lecturer, but I started working with industry and actually the aerospace industry particularly. And I went along really enthusiastically and um, was surprised that no one believed my mathematical models. And like, so like traditional engineering and industry um, come from much more practical, rightly so. They're here to make things. Um, they kind of want to do experiments where they're physical, they test them. Um, so they much more believe kind of a classic experimental data and experience. And uh, so a bit disheartened, I realized it was my problem, not their problem. And I was really then interested in about um, how do I convince people about the value of models uh, to help make decisions? How do I bring data together with that? Uh, so models and data sing together. And then more and more, I realized that ultimately the decision makers in business are neither data scientists, experimentalists, or mathematicians. They tend to be business leaders, and they operate at a higher level. And so really, um, it focused on about um, my research and the, the methods we developed was focused on about how you empower decision makers to use evidence to make decisions and understand this process of making decisions. Um, and then what you realize is actually, as humans, we one like looking at what possible options might happen. So given a situation, given data, we're really quite um, uh, good at um, understanding, well, this is the likely thing that will happen based on my experience and what I can see, um, but this might also happen, so I need to protect against this. So we have as decision makers, as humans, without knowing it, a very acute awareness of risk when we make decisions. And uh, so our research and, and the methods that I created as an academic were really aligned with providing models and data together that um, didn't give you a, a definitive answer. Like I know I'm some, some kind of oracle truth. It gave you an answer which had uncertainty bounds around it and elements of explainability. So why am I giving this prediction uh, opposed to another prediction? And um, I think, you know, that's a really central part. 
I was kind of lucky that this area, which is really traditional maths and stats and decision making, really is a cornerstone of, of modern machine learning and AI now. Um, how do we use models? Like if we're going to use an algorithm to predict skin cancer, or we're going to predict the water quality in, in the X River, which is one project we do, and uh, people are going to drink it or they're going to swim in it. Like we need to be certain that the decisions we're making or suggesting from algorithms have evidence associated and we're comfortable with the likely outcomes. And, um, and so this has been a really integral part and increasingly integral part of machine learning. Um, I became a professor at Exeter. Uh, my group grew to uh, about 40. So it was uh, over a two year period. Um, and it was so it's not really a model that fits within a, in a university. Uh, it's a very fast growing area um, with lots of commercial interest. And so Exeter University really supported me and one of my PhD students at the time spinning out Digilab as a company um, and it's now growing rapidly. So that was my journey. So from some academic writing papers to, to CTO, co-founder of a, a tech startup. So, yeah. Brilliant. Wow. What a, a, it sounds like a very kind of steep learning curve for you as well. To, yeah, you know, different, mind, different mindset. So I think the, the, the definitive thing of why I love Digilab was when we had our first contract with Southwest Water and we like we were improving water quality in, in, in the river that I swim in and, and you know goes out where I surf. Um, so my wife traditionally would, would hear me write about papers that I would write as an academic and she'd be like, oh, yeah, what, whatever. And then I said, oh, we built an algorithm that was will improve water quality in the X. And it's the first time I've come home over tea and I'm like, actually, oh, that's a really good thing to do. So it's, like, it's just sort of, you know, it's actually much more tangible for me. And that impact or that direct connection with using math and, and methods to to improve our environment uh, where we are is, you know, has real tangible. I still like writing papers and methods and uh, doing science, but that sort of connection with impact has been a really fulfilling thing of setting a, a startup. Great. Awesome. Oh, it's so, it's so interesting. And especially, um, the idea that you're applying, uh, the, the work that you're doing to, to really local issues as well as probably global ones too. Um, I'd really like to tap into that a little bit more now. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to decide whether to ask you a bit more about that. I think it might be helpful actually to, to paint the picture for those, uh, uh, members of the audience who haven't really heard much or explored much about what mathematical models are. Um, it might be quite helpful just to kind of, uh, to clarify that a little bit more. So you've kind of given us a bit of an idea that, you know, you're, you're using data in a way that can make predictions. Um, I wonder, I don't know whether it's worth giving us a, a very basic case study. I mean, you've already said about the Southwest water one, maybe that's a, a good option or, or whatever you think to, to give us a feel for what a mathematical model is, what goes into it and, and, uh, Maybe we can get a little bit later as to how yeah. AI helps with that, but let's see. Yeah, so example of a mathematics. So if you take an aircraft, for example, an aircraft is a structure. Um, and uh, when we bend it, it, it as, a, as a structure, it responds to forces. So when we take off, uh, it has to, uh, it gets lift from takeoff and, uh, and then the wing, the wing will support bending. So we're used to this kind of idea that um, a structure that we build supports load. Um, and so, sort of centuries of academic pursuit from right back to say newtons understand about how forces balance on objects uh, and so we've and how materials respond to forces and so we've um, accrued centuries of knowledge of distilling this understanding this fundamental understanding of this connection between forces and movement and stretch or deformation of our materials. Okay. And really that's a mathematical model, right? So we use this knowledge, we can write equations which describe how forces and displacements balance when a wing is subjected to load, and we can make predictions. Mm -hmm. Now, the predictions, whilst they're, even though they're grounded on lots of um, historic knowledge and experience about what happens, they're only, um, they're not perfect, right? They're, they're still, there's, um, influences from all sorts of things that affect a plane. We might not really know the exact geometry of it. Uh, we might not know the exact wing conditions which are hitting that plane. So there's uncertainty associated with it. And so you can never expect a model to give you this kind of perfect oracle answer of what will happen if it takes off. But it's a good estimate because it's distilled all our knowledge in it. Um, and so mathematicians kind of focus on how do you solve those equations and make predictions. Um, I guess data scientists say, well, let's fly the plane and see how it responds in conditions, right? And, and, okay. and so another way of understanding or making predictions is just from observation, right? Um, 
And the, the reassuring thing about observation is it's the real world. You see it happen. So you kind of feel comfortable that, okay, that plane looks like it's going to fly. Okay. Um, you know, I feel comfortable about the design. And, and, but the point is on experiments, when you're designing a plane, you can't do lots and lots of experiments. You can't break a million planes and see what happens, but you can run a million models, right? Mm -hmm. And so where, where models and data really sing together is um, data and observations ground your truth. So you feel comfortable that it's, it's reality. What models allow you to do is explore between points that you haven't observed in data, but you might see in the range of scenarios. And so this is how I always see that, you know, models and uh, data play together. Models just encapsulate our knowledge of and experience of what we understand about forces or and deformation, but it could be any system about how diseases spread or how uh, fluid flows over a coral reef or how physics or plasma works in a fusion reactor. We have lots of knowledge in, in mathematical equations about predictions of how this will happen. And these can help us uh, connect with data to, to understand how to make decisions in situations where we haven't made observations. Okay, that's that's a really nice description. I like the fact that you used a, a plane because it's a very kind of you know tangible thing that people can think of. But I suppose so. If, just to kind of um, see that I understand this, <laughs> so uh, so mathematical models, you know, you're kind of using equations, known things to describe and, and predict behaviors. With uh, then when the data comes in, it's kind of you know taking actual measurements. So perhaps if you were to you know if we use the plane analogy. Um, you might be taking data from a plane, maybe not all, you know, keep smashing them and, and, you know, things like that. But maybe you have some data that you would take that goes in back into your model, improves it. I'm kind of thinking of maybe climate modeling uh, as well as another analogy there, you know, adding in temperature data, wind data, uh, surface, sea surface temperature data and everything to feed back into your models, which have all the equations in there and, and checking them constantly to see if they predict yeah, uh, things correctly. That'd be about. And then the, key, the key thing is that physics, we understand certain principles of, mm. of the world, like conservation of mass, which means you can't just suddenly generate mass. Like mm -hmm. if I have a fluid, I um, the system, you can't, the, the fluid just doesn't disappear. So I must how somehow if fluid flows from here to here, the overall amount of fluid must stay the same. Now, when we observe data, data knows nothing about physics. It's just observations. But we cleverly, as, as modelers, encapsulated that we understand that, you know, mass just doesn't disappear and we need to account for it. And so by having models that, that bring these predictions between two observations, yeah. when we make predictions in places where we haven't observed data, they can still respect known laws that we understand really well. And so we have much more confidence that the predictions we make will make physical sense and, and they're coherent, as we say. Awesome, great. So that was a bit of a bit of a nerdy detour there, just to just to fill in for people what what a model is, and hopefully that's kind of comfortable. But I kind of want to go back a little bit into what what DigiLab do. So you've mentioned a few things um, already in terms of you know um, measuring and and predicting water quality. I kind of want to tap into that problem a little bit more, but maybe could you give us a bit more of an overview of all the sectors? Because you work in the engineering, across the engineering, energy. Uh, what what does that involve? And, you know, who do you tend to work with? So um, so when we started or well, started DigiLab, um, I had three Ps and, and it will cover probably things that I know we're going to talk about. Um, the first P is people. So really investing in people, providing a culture and environment for uh, scientific people to excel. Um, it's planet, so all of our applications are connected with sustainability uh, in something, in some way. Sustainability in a broad sense that, um, like the areas that we work in are, I'd say predominantly, 60% uh, of our projects are in fusion energy, so an exciting area about, you know, how do we create clean, sustainable energy, a real investment area in the U UK and a really exciting physics area as well. Uh, but also sustainability in terms of water quality, uh, making water available, sustainability in terms of being able to adapt to uh, needs in terms of population, in terms of uh, healthcare, and um, and also agri-tech in terms of being able to feed people. So very broad in terms of sustainability, but we don't, we, we it must be connected to some kind of clear idea of sustainability in what we do. Um, and then the final thing is profit. Like um, I've quickly learned that 
um, it's essential that a good business provides stability for those solutions and the people that are in it only by producing a sustainable, profitable business, um, um, which is, you know, so you need the three Ps, as it were. Um, maybe to expand on the areas we work in, we work across, uh, we've got projects in water, um, development of catalysts for hydrogen, um, design of fusion reactors, uh, monitoring of coral reefs for global coral conservation, um uh, nuclear decommissioning so how do we effectively and efficiently get rid of waste um uh, from from sort of legacy plants um you know potentially tidal power lots of different areas so um you kind of they they kind of the broad theme is about conservation uh and and energy um, yeah awesome oh it sounds so interesting I re i'm so glad that you're our, our first speaker because it's it's really exciting to know that this kind of stuff is going on in the southwest and in exeter as well you know um i, I think a lot of people you know still don't know so much about it so yeah i'm, I'm really pleased that you uh you know had the chance to to chat to us this evening um I, I, yeah and i really like the whole idea of you know people planet and profit the the idea of that especially for us as a charity at the moment we're we're kind of rethinking our, our our business model and how we can be a sustainable charity. Because of course, you know, we need, we need to kind of think like a business. We need to have enough income so that we can employ staff. And so uh, I, I'm kind of keen to get onto that that side of things too. And then we can get back onto the nerdy details again about, you know, um, some some projects because they all sound really interesting too. So um, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe we can kind of go back into the kind of organizational structure that you created. And um, so Michelle tells us that you have four day weeks as standard. Um, and we were very, you know, kind of excited about that because it's something we'd love to do, but just feel like we don't have enough time at the moment. But um, we'd love to know you about your experience and what kind of, um, uh, yeah, how, I suppose, it, what kind of policies have you put in place for your, uh, for your organization? You know, there's this new startup that you wanted to be progressive. And yeah, I'd love to hear more about that. So that's great. And, and um yeah, I think when you talk to sort of traditional older business people, maybe you talk about a four day week where they still get their full pay. It's just like this doesn't sound like how businesses should be run. Um, but we were adamant when we started DigiLab that this was the way forward. What I noticed about even, you know, managing people in, in a large team um, and also like people have really busy lives. Right. And um, we have uh, constantly developed technology to make us more efficient, but we haven't saved ourselves the space. We haven't had the trade-off, right? So we just do more and more stuff. Um, and what you realize is um, people become, well, they're just tired uh, because they, they have like Monday to Friday, it's, it's a grind at work. Um, and when people are really engaged with th their work, I believe, they don't suddenly leave their work or their thoughts at home. Like, I, no, as soon as they get in the front door at home, they will still so either subconsciously or actively be thinking about how they do a good job. And, and so it's not really fair to say um, it's a four day week anyway, because I'm pretty sure that on the Friday that um, people don't work in our business and they're doing climbing together or going for a walk or spending it with family or whatever they choose to do with their day off, um, they will still be having thoughts about, oh, I wonder I could do that. Um, could I do this? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's really, it's a four day week where they have to come into the office. Um, they're not allowed to have meetings on Friday, so they're banned, right? You have to go and um, I think we encourage like language around what did you do with your Friday? And it's mm -hmm. always interesting to hear what people did with their own time. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think, um, they are more resistant to stress um, so that, you know, all jobs, even the best jobs come with stress and there's deadlines. Um, but when people know that they've got a longer break and a weekend or a space to sort of let go of it, it's not such a big thing when they have to kind of knuckle down and get something done. Um, I think we've seen compared to other organizations, we've seen less sickness and time off. Um, and, and yeah, and I, you know, I'm a, I'm a rig big believer i also think in in the engineering culture if you look on a friday everyone sends emails around at 11 o'clock on friday and says yeah that's a good idea tim i'll send you something on monday yeah. i mean like so mentally lots of people and organizations have already checked out and so let's just be honest about that and and give it back to them right yeah, I love that. That's so cool. And uh, yeah, it's something we've we've chatted about with our trustees and, you know, see if we can implement that at some point when we're 
at a financially sustainable level. But um, yeah, I really love that. So uh, yeah, and this is a reminder for everyone who's watching. If you have questions about that, how that's working uh, with Tim's organization, you know, uh, let us know. Post in the post in the chat, and we'll see if we can um, see if we can, we can ask would, about that. I would hmm. challenge that. Um, you know, if you had the question, is if you could demonstrate you are more efficient. Um, mm. Where does where does the money come in, right? Like, yeah, uh, like, and 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 so if you can kind of, you know, I know there's lots of people have uh, now have been asked about it. Let's do a trial, right? And mm -hmm. I must admit, it will be very hard to get people to go back once you go one way. I just think just, but but I think you could clearly measure over a period how productivity worked. Did you actually do less work, and how did it influence? I think it becomes more challenging with business where they offer services, and there's kind of around the clock services. And so you might need staggered people to work that. We're lucky that that's not the case. They're, they're, we have software that we develop, but, um, you know, and and projects that we're on, uh, but, uh, you know, it's not essential, like everyone just has the Friday off, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, but I would sort of challenge people to ask that question if they ever get held to account, like, oh yeah, but we can't afford it. Well, you can if it makes you more efficient overall, right? Yeah, I guess so. That's true. I know we keep thinking, oh no, we, we're just constantly, you know, 100% efficient all the time, but we're not, you know, <laughs> we're really tired. <laughs> you know, it's, not it's not. Cheap, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm curious, did you, did you trial it at your organization or did you impose it, you know, no, uh, integrate it from the start? From the start. And okay. uh, I think there's, um, so you, there's some been important evidence and science studies around it saying that it's important that you have um, in the language of the business, you talk about the, f the fifth day, so it doesn't come redundant. So the business, the business encour like encourages you to do something with your fifth day. You're not allowed to work. We talk about what we ask people what they did, um, and 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 I think that's super important in the sense because otherwise people don't get complacent. Like the the, the biggest worry is okay. Well, if you have four days, you'll want three days. And, and and so there's a culture about you know this is a privilege and I'm enjoying it and I want to share what I did with the organisation mm. and rather than oh it's just four days it's the fourth day the fifth day is given to you for you for your mental health and to be productive for the business and for you right yeah um, yeah I really like that kind of being mindful I suppose of this yeah, yeah. Uh, of this it time just become it comes to life right and, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, a good thing that we should all be happy about. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. No, I really like that. And I've just seen we've had a comment from Tom. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, Tom says, uh, did you start the company with a four day work from, week from day one? I think you, you answered that. You, yeah. yeah. Really like that, you know, because, because in a way you didn't really have that data of, will we be more productive? How did you kind of gauge whether it was uh, more productive for you? Or did you just say, you know, we will all be productive? I don't know. How did you? I, I, mean, you I just, just it just went for it. I, mm -hmm. I mean, it was a belief that having observed people, um, you know, particularly observing behavior on a Friday when people were tired, I think it's, um, you know, it, I, I, I thought that, you know, there was a very low risk of this being a bad bet. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, great. And uh, and I noticed there's another question in there as well, uh, which I'll pop up on the screen if I can work out how to do that. There we go. Um, so uh, we have a question from a LinkedIn user. Is this about efficiency or effectiveness? Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Um, I think both. Like, so effect, I think when you know you're working for four days, you, 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 um, it's like, um, it's like an idea like I'm a runner, right? So it's like a like if you if you clearly define the boundary that you've you've got to do your interval and you know it's gonna, you know, you, you can go hard at it as you like, but it's time bounded and it's well defined. And I think what people are and it's easier if the interval's shorter, like you feel like, but you know you've got to get a certain amount of effort into that interval to, for it to be effective. And so I think people become more focused about. I need to do X, like I'm not, you know, um, so I think people naturally have capacity to work four days a week. But what happens when you have a five day organization is people fill it in with procrastination because they're trying to sort of manage that I can't work at this pace all the time. And um, and so it's, it's really just saying instead of being at work and doing that. Um, we'll just have a great day and do something independent of that and and realize that you, you give yourself space there. So I think people do are more aware of how they are, can be effective in the time that they have. Um, efficiency can be in many ways, like as business efficiency, 
if people are more resilient and off sick less and 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 the, the business is more efficient for what it pays people which is like a very hard line but ultimately from a profitability business it's and it's an efficiency decision which which you which you recoup i believe yeah. And we, we kind of spoke about this in the uh, before we started here, but um, <clears throat> thinking about the fact that, it, you know, arbitrarily five days, you know, why not three days? Why not four days or five days? You know, it's, it's almost arbitrary. It's almost as if, well, that's that's kind of the most that we can get out of people. <laughs> you know, they need two days off. And, and like you say, I really like the fact that, you know, we've we've made things more efficient. We're working so much more effectively than we have, you know, maybe, uh, let's say 20 years ago with emails and phone calls, zoom calls and everything else. Uh, yeah. I mean, where do we draw the line? Do we say we just keep working flat out for five days or do we pull it back, uh, to four yeah, days? I had, or so I had this lovely thing that my PhD supervisor, when he was a programmer, he used to have to write punch cards, right? And so these, like, so these are little cards that you punch in, which which encode what you want to do. Okay. You then package them up in the right order. You then send this off to, to to a computer, and then you got you got the answer back. And that was just like, this is madness. We're in a in a culture now where you can write a program. If you're a programmer, you can compile it and get an answer back instantly. And um, you know, and then we're doing this constantly, right? And so. Um, you know, and, and tech generally, you think of large language models, the ability to sort of um, collect or retrieve data from hard, large numbers of resources. You know, we are way more efficient. And uh, I think that, you know, sort of people deserve a trade off. right? So. Yeah, I guess this kind of ties into that whole question of, you know, this thing about AI taking our jobs or, you know, well, maybe we should work a bit less and have a bit more life or life balance, you know, and do more volunteering, more things that we actually want to do yeah. if there are other things as well I, I kind of see where people are coming with that and I, it's mm. a new thing and it can be threatening and and for someone in I know I, I often go to talks that are non-technical and everyone talks about uh, generalized artificial intelligence like it's coming and I, and, I, and I feel I guess when you're in the field you worry less because you see what you know algorithms still at the stage of struggling to make a cup of tea as a robot like you know like so you kind of feel like well okay we're all right but I think um you know, it's kind of like the 80-20 principle. Like if AI can do the boring 80% and then you can really creatively do the engaging 20%, uh, which will always be there because, you know, the nature of being a creative human, um, then that's great. And uh, and and so um, I, I think lots of things where if AI can do it, you should let it do it. And you should focus on the things that you either don't want AI to do or they shouldn't do, right? <laughs> yeah. So I guess this is kind of like, you know, we need a bit of a restructuring in our society in many ways. But, uh, you know, thinking about how people work and different roles that people can have and the, the benefits that, that, that actual humans can have in job roles, you know, making sure that they're, they're happy as well when they're doing it. Um, I just noticed as well, we've had another question. Thanks again, Tom. So we've got, um, you mentioned that your employees come into the office. Let me see if I can put this on the screen uh, for those four days. What are your opinions on working from home and its impact on that efficiency and effectiveness question, which I think John sent in. Thank you. This is, and I, I'm probably not the norm here, but um, particularly in a small company which thrives on, on close communication and, and working and we want a diverse set of people and skills at, at the table. I'm, I'm a big believer in getting people in the office, right? And um, uh, as much as possible. And I think there are some roles um, when you have a bigger organization for example wh where you can sit at home with your headphones on and it's just about focus and they're, they're, they're right for those kind of roles but certainly in our business um one of the biggest things about building a culture and an environment um i really look forward to going into work i look forward to the first coffee of the day where there's chit chat and uh, that interaction and you can you can ask people how their projects are going and you can hear you can learn something new and you can do that over, um, you know, online. But I really struggled in COVID times. I was desperate to get back in the office just for that interaction um, and sort of, in, you know, learning about what other people are doing, which I found much harder to get. Um, so DigiLab is a company, I think, at the scale we're at, sort of in the sort of mid-30s of people's, um, you know, they come into the office uh, four days a week. Um, we do have um, a few that are remote working for the particular roles that fit that but they're fully remote as and they're not based in exeter um but um you know we're proudly in office in exeter a really nice office with lots of good coffee so that's all you nice. need 
that's all you need i work with scientists is, that sounds know. a real them in good coffee oh, yeah exactly <laughs> Nice. Excellent. Yeah. And it seems, um, so thanks very much, Tom, for that question. Um, and yeah, I'm curious as well. So just to kind of, I mean, there are, there are more kind of progressive policies as well that you've, you, that you've built in. I just wanted to just finish off with a four day week one, cause it is kind of exciting for us. Um, could I ask how many hours a day do you guys tend to work? Is it, do you work more hours? Is it kind of an eight hour day or a seven hour day or, um, how does yeah, that work? So, I mean, it's eight hour day in a contract. Um, mm -hmm. I, but it's quite a flexible day. So I have um, four children um, and uh, being a present parent is uh, an important part of my life. Um, and so um, I tend to come in very early um, and get some focus time, you know, before everyone else is up probably. Um, and then I tend to leave for the school run and then I might do a bit in the evening, I catch up on emails. So like it's as a business, I don't think it's always helpful to m monitor uh exactly how many hours you do uh, um but there's um ensuring that people do the right and fair representation to their job is is a cultural thing that you build rather than a monitoring thing and uh and i think if everyone works hard and there's a culture of working hard and communicating then there's a sort of uh, an implicit pressure that you should comply and do your fair share for the mm -hmm. community in the business um rather than being like we're going to watch you until um uh to, you know people have children and i have children that i you know want to support and need to support um and a family a broader family and so that's part of my life and i hope others in the work get to do that i think a really um interesting thing for a four-day week is for people that want to be part-time it is a much better deal and um i would say on average they are, are like females when they have family often look for part-time uh on average um, and so it gives a much more attractive way for their wage to go back into work. Mm -hmm. so if you do three days out of four, a four day week, you have 75% of a full pay yeah. rather than three fifths of a pay that you would have, but you can still feel that you can do, uh, what you want with parenting and, and also, you know, have a fulfilling, fulfilling job and, and balance those two. Um, so I think we've seen that in kind of the. Uh, by sort of stretching, being against the normal gender mix in our organisation. Um, so, yeah. It's really great to hear, especially in a tech company, uh, you know, because yeah, I know not... I've heard that uh, uh, women in tech, uh, there's not as many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, certainly. So we, um, yeah, we, we're aiming for 50-50. We're not quite there yet, mm -hmm. uh, but we, we, it's, a, it's a key KPI for our business. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't know the current percentage because we've done some mixture of hiring at the moment, but... I think we're certainly north of 30 and we have zero gender pay gap. So, um, it's, uh, like, and it's, um, I think a big driver is, is having more flexible working and, Great. and, and sort of that culture to be more flexible around other needs, which sort of goes away from this kind of traditional five days a week, you must yeah. be there around schools, you know, it's, it's just a modern way of doing things, right? Awesome. Yeah, I really like that. And I wonder whether you can fill us in on the other progressive policies that you've implemented. So, you know, flexible working and and, uh, and things as well. Are there any other things that you're particularly proud of that you'd like to to share and influence and inspire us uh, yeah, as so founders? Other, I mean, the other thing I think is, um, you know, um, yeah, so there's obviously the beanbag culture in a startup, right? You need flexible, you need beanbags, right? Like you need space. <laughs> that sort cool. of thing. Um, but I, I think having a really nice office is actually a really nice space to work. So we're really lucky to be within a community in the generator hub. So if you know your experts down at the key um, and it's kind of a bunch of freelancers, startups, um, they've been a very welcoming space. It's been super. Um, so you actually feel attached to a wider community than that. So it is, I would say, the tech community in Exeter. And um, and it's nice to be there. And there are all sorts of things going on. Um, and people with different kind of outlooks on life rather than, you know, techie people. We've got a lot of physicists. They are a particular type of person sometimes. And sort of being in an environment where there are lots of different people has been amazing. So I think trying to embrace that environment and hold on to that environment has been good. Um, and I also, so like, policies in terms of what we provide our our employees um having giving them so we give them ment, uh, sort of budget from sort of mental health advice um so they can reach out to professionals we see more and more that people you know are 
complicated and they live in their heads quite a lot. And um, having independent advice, which is sort of separate from DigiLab, which lets them manage things in their outside of work and maybe in work, um, is a is a really good thing. Um, that's something we've implemented recently, and people have taken up on it. And people that probably wouldn't have reached out and chatted with someone about processing the ways they think about things. So um, I think you know, mental health is uh, something that we talk about, and. Uh, you know, it's something, it's mental health, so it's something that everyone needs to look after. Yeah. And, 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 and an employee is a big part of looking after people's mental health. But, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, it's great to hear. It's really nice that, you you know, uh, it kind of comes back to your, your people planet and uh, uh, well, what's the third one? Hold on, I wrote it down. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Profit. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but that, you know, feeds in again in the same way that you were saying about, you know, giving fair salaries to your to your staff members and things too do you have a, a kind of a, a pay scale or a, how, how does that work yeah so one of the challenges in and i think you know this is one of the challenges with ai mm -hmm. is that the big tech companies have kind of really stretched the market in terms mm -hmm. of um you know people with ai capabilities that are sought after and then you see brain drain like people have you know typically in the uk run to you know the triangle uh oxford cambridge mm -hmm. and london and uh, so that's really difficult for places like Exeter. And I was originally told that you'll never be able to build a tech company in Exeter. Um, and uh, so if you know me well, like if you, if you say that I can't do something, that's just like, well, OK, I'm going to prove you wrong. Um, and so that's why I like the policies in terms of, you know, making it an environment, an engaging environment, a community are equally as important as pay, but also being able to offer higher pay than universities yeah. because, you know, universities are large nonprofit organizations. Uh, they have caps they're more rigid uh, and so you can kind of be flexible as a as an organization um yeah i've already mentioned that it's important to track for us uh, gender pay gap so that we have um you know balance across um genders uh, in in terms of roles as well which has been an important part but yeah i mean tech pays well um so i know um it's certainly a, a good career move and being a coder and having quantitative skills at the moment is only going to increase your your ability um, I think the other thing is COVID's benefit to the Southwest is people realized that you didn't have to be in London to earn good salaries or contribute to tech. Um, and so there was kind of a big, I don't know, house prices flooded in, in around me on Dartmoor um, because they realized that, that people can actually see green stuff and be out there and not be in central London. They can be anywhere. And so I think that's been, a, you know, there was lots of negatives about COVID, but a positive mindset in the sense that we're not restricted to being in a big city or in Cambridge to be a tech leader, right? Yeah, awesome. Well, keep going. I mean, it's so exciting that there's this kind of growing tech industry in the Southwest. And, um, you know, a, a little while ago, we were speaking to someone who said, you know, think of Exeter as the uh, the California of, uh, of of the UK, you know, tech companies and amazing beaches as well. <laughs> so, uh, so it's great. Wait, that we have so, right, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah awesome. Um, so brilliant. And there was something actually that I, I really wanted to mention, because we chatted about this a little bit beforehand. You were kind of uh, talking about how, you know, your really inclusive culture in, in terms of uh, you know, how the four day week is, is beneficial for people with alternative um, needs, you know, whether that's dyslexia or, or otherwise. Um, would you like to comment on that too? I think it, it's, it was a really interesting point you made. It's quite a personal one because I, I'm, I'm dyslexic. I always wonderfully have been. And um, I think um, it really made me realize that school was quite frustrating for some level. I, could, I was always lucky I could do math and science. So I kind of slipped under the radar. Uh, but sort of the sort of conforming ways of which we do education, uh, um, um, sort of like the molds that fit with business, you write emails and, and this is how you process and you must follow these. You know, this is really difficult for, for me as a, a dyslexic where I thought in pictures or language when we speak much more easily than the written word. And so I was always really conscious about trying to build a business that enabled people with different ways of thinking. Um, and different means that, you know, there are people in our business. We've got a head of business, Amanda, who's wonderful. She did a PhD in, in uh, literature. And so she's you know, completely opposite to me. She writes she writes stuff down very neatly and, and processes things through the written word. But also in our business, you know, then you've got me that just draws pictures and thinks of things very visually. Um, and I think it's about, um, you know, trying to encourage an environment where, um, people can work and process information and excel in different ways rather than 
necessarily conforming always to the norm way we think traditional you know work should be done um particularly for me that uh having space doing so i'm a i often run or uh find that my ideas come to me while surfing and that's because it's it's like the processing of that information uh is 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 something that you you, you kind of have to go to rather than be writing it down and so having a different space to to process information is equally as important as sitting down doing work so i always find time not at a desk can be more productive than than time sat at the desk for my kind of thinking but i'm not alone in that it's kind of you know it's just finding different ways for people to be you know demonstrate their abilities and skills right yeah awesome i really like that and there's, there's a lot of uh things that we try to do for for example you know making our exhibitions or our events more accessible as soon as you make things more accessible for say one particular group everyone benefits it's always an improvement so you know the idea of implementing a four-day week even just on you know making it more uh, accessible for for people that's it makes yeah. it better for everyone. Yeah, I really like that. Um, anyway, I, I, you know, obviously, I, I really love the idea of four day week, and I could go on I, about it for a long time. But <laughs> like, it sounds like you're, you know, ninety five percent. Oh, we should probably go for it. Yeah, I need to need to work that out. Need need to get some uh, get some funding in first. Um, so uh, yeah, I think uh, it would be really nice actually. If we've got any more questions, please do send them in, everyone. Um, it's been nice to have your thoughts so far. I wonder if we can get into some nerdy details about uh, about the work that you're doing at, at DigiLab. So you've mentioned. You've mentioned the the water quality one. I think for a lot of people around the southwest, uh, water quality, especially for people who like to go out and, and swim in rivers and the sea, as, as you said that you you uh, like to do as well. Uh, yeah. How how is that working? That's a really interesting idea. You know, do you, do you take is that do, you know taking in the data, taking in measurements, and feeding that into a model? Uh, the predictability sounds quite interesting on on that for water quality. Exactly. So um, so the rivers up and down the country worldwide are sensitive. They have data. Mm -hmm. Um, so they measure things like turbidity, which is like how clear the water is. So okay. they know how much floaty stuff is in it. Like, um, like if you put your head under it, how murky it is, mm -hmm. uh, like pH and all sorts of things. Um, and there are strict requirements, um, which, you know, companies get penalized against rightly. So is, is if they don't control the water quality sufficiently, um, downstream on, and what they pump out. And, um, I think you know these are large organizations with huge amounts of data uh but kind of legacy data that's not been uh it's very difficult to get value out of it's very noisy their sensors they're sometimes on they're sometimes off uh they can be quite spiky in their responses um only things like cloud infrastructure for data are now a thing so we've got historic data where it's kind of in a load of spreadsheets I think organizations, uh, you know, it's a real challenge to, to rethink how you structure your data and your organization around how do we effectively most use that data. Mm. But I guess modern machine learning has the ability to see patterns in data. You can clean data automatically. Um, you can get rid of all the kind of dodgy bits of data that where the sensor hasn't been working. Um, and, then, and, and then you can harness that data to help make decisions. Um, and so... Uh, really, in, in that work, we can, when we start ingesting the data via a machine learning algorithm, we can start forecasting what will happen in the next two, four, eight hours uh, using models, both on models like the traditional models of flow and how things change over time, but also on data. Uh, and we can make, so by being able to make predictions ahead of time, it means you can be predictive rather than reactive. And, um, and if you can be predictive, you can say, actually, uh, to stop overflowing the pipes, for example, I could let out all of this water that's being held in storage tanks prior to, to when, so I know that my system has got enough capacity to be able to hold all the rainwater. Mm -hmm. Or I could know I could start putting small bits of coagulant, which, which basically is a chemical which joins particles together and makes water cleaner in smaller doses earlier um, so that I don't have to dump loads of it in to try and improve water quality as a reactive measure. So the, our ability to learn from data, to process data, and then to actually be able to use it to make decisions um, makes us more effective in using the resources we've got. So we kind of demonstrated by being able to do that, you would be able to reduce the amount of chemicals um, in the X River by about 40%. But simultaneously, um, you would have better water quality. Um, and so, you know, it's, um, 
it's really yeah it's so it's good stuff yeah that's great I mean not only good you know to be using less chemicals from a kind of you know using less chemicals perspective but you know I suppose it saves money as well and uh it, I mean, you need, um, you can use resources and uh, engineers to, you know, you're more effectively because algorithms are monitoring things rather than being dependent on sort of manual intervention. So you can use, you can have better coverage of water systems. Uh, there's lots of areas in water where, uh, but like water's not alone. I'd say lots of engineering industries are traditionally non, you know, not, um, digital or they're not well connected in terms of their data streams which makes it very difficult for them to know how to exploit machine learning and ai right? hmm. yeah 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 well hopefully you know i guess it's moved so quickly uh, really and they probably haven't you know weren't thinking ahead and uh, and thinking about that but hopefully in the next kind of five ten years or i don't know is there anything you'd like to say to those people who are in those kind of organizations what could they do to improve things at the moment more more uh, kind of sensors and more uh and and better software or yeah so i mean i think there's two approaches really mm. i like so so you could say, oh, I'm going to build, so Southwest Water, which we work with, or Yorkshire Water, or, or any of the companies across, they could say, oh, we're just going to get a machine learning team in, right? Mm-hmm. And um, they're very expensive. It's not really aligned to their business model. Like, um, and I don't think engineers really want machine learners in their business. Like engineers believe other engineers, right? And so I think a fundamental thing long-term is about um, the companies like us, hopefully providing tools which enable the engineers to use methods more effectively so that you keep the domain experts, but they become more comfortable with the tools and methods that they could use to adopt AI rather than this, everyone must be uh, like, we must hire a load of data scientists because it's not really the model. Like the experts know about water systems. The experts know about how to build planes. It's just that AI can make them better at doing that and, and make them more efficient within that space. So I think organizations will see a huge transition in terms of upskilling their engineers uh, with capabilities that now let them use AI tools or at least let them sensibly question, is this a good thing to do with AI or not? Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest problem when you talk to organizations is most people think chat GPT is AI and that's it now. Uh, and and actually, the, it's encompassing a whole suite of possible methods that you could use. Some are extremely well tested and have been used for years. Um, but it's hard to know what if you don't know what you can do. You know, you, you don't really know what questions to ask. So, I would say a lot of it's about upskilling, and that's what we found with working with organisations. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, fantastic. And I, I, wouldn't, I think the, this next question might kind of fill in a little bit more about uh, the, the use of AI, because that was going to be my other question. Uh, so thank you so much. It just comes up on my screen as LinkedIn user. So I'm not sure who you are, but thank you very much. Let's pop this on the screen. So uh, the question is, have you mentioned Digilab's uh, two other business areas, uh, training in AI to increase the level of skills likely to be required by all organizations, um, and the Twin Lab platform, enabling others to experiment with and implement their own models so perhaps yeah. this is one of your colleagues uh who's very very conveniently uh sent right. in this <laughs> yeah. question. Uh, good question though. and it kind of links to what i say so we we realized then when we started working with organizations that whilst you might be able to build the solution for them mm-hmm. it's not really a scalable business model because there's only a finite number of us right and um the better business model is was always been to build um a service, a software as a service, SaaS model, where they can access our tools and capabilities that we develop in-house. Um, and um, and so um, we have software, uh, a, a, which is a, a collection of libraries of, of methods which are accessible, which we call TwinLab. So it's basically our capabilities, which you can access um, via an API, you can call it. We've even integrated it into Excel. So, you know, we found out most engineers use Excel for their data. So um, sort of remove the snobbery around data scientists and Excel and give people access to it there. Um, and so that's that's kind of our core business. But what we realized is even if you knew that you could access these methods, you'd be asking the question, well, what is it and what do I do? Um, and a lot of us come from educational backgrounds. Um, I'm, I'm passionate about education. So we we created Digilab Academy, which was a series of online courses, and we run in-person workshops for training, really to help organizations and individuals get over that barrier. 
Um, we did think it was a business model originally, but what we realized is it's just part of our duty to share machine learning. So our DigiLab Academy online courses are going to be made completely open soon. So everyone will be able to access them. They'll be able to know the difference between supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And, you know, how do I build a control algorithm to do X, right? Like, um, there's lots of courses online. Michelle's got a lovely course on what do I need to think about in terms of ethics of using AI. Nice. Um, so lots of different things. Great. So, um, yeah, um, it's a really key part that, when you're selling a new thing, a new technology, um, infra products naturally sit with products, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I love that you're making that open source. That's really great. So uh, we'll just certainly try and link to it from our from our website. We like to, to highlight good uh, open source resources. So thank you very much. That was John uh, who asked the question. Thanks, John. That's 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 brilliant. Um, so I wonder maybe if we get get in a little bit more into um, into the use of AI. I'm conscious of the time. Maybe we'll we'll um, we'll ask a few more questions. But any you know any further questions, please do send them through to us. Um, but yeah, can, maybe you can tell us uh, a bit more about the use of AI in particular. So you know with, we think of data science and big data, and that's been thrown around quite a lot. But but what is it that AI really helps you with in this? Because as you quite rightly said, AI isn't just ChatGPT. ChatGPT is a large language model, right? That's very good at synthesizing text and making it sound like, a, you know, and formulating responses. How, how is the AI you use very different to that? So um, actually, we come from completely the other end of the spectrum. So I always give the example like traditional big data AI is like the likes of Amazon. And so like Amazon or like, they've got probably like, I think it's something like 567 numbers that uniquely classify you as a user, right? These describe, so they monitor like your behavior. So they know when you, you go onto Amazon, you scroll down and then you quickly scroll up. This, this says that you've got particular attention on this thing. They monitor the things that you buy so that you, they can align you with other buyers and build recommendation systems, mm -hmm. right? Um, and this is kind of big data AI. Um, and I'm, and so they just ingested masses of human behavior and data and purchasing uh, to do that. But say, um, you know, Amazon recommends that I buy pink pants, right? You know, thinks I might want to buy pink pants. Ooh, that's, sorry about that. Um, and um, you, um, so yeah, Amazon recommends that you buy pink pants and then, okay, but I don't do it then the consequences of that are kind of really minimal. Uh, like, okay, or recommend me something else and like, you know, maybe I'll buy green pants instead. Um, but the difference with our AI is like, now we're trying to build a fusion reactor and we're trying to make sensible decisions about something that doesn't even physically exist yet properly. Like there are, there are scaled experiments that do parts of it or elements of it, but you're trying to make predictions about something where there's no data, right? So. This is a completely opposite end of, of the spectrum that we've got limited information and data. We've got lots of expert opinion, like right? people aren't really either through models uh, and so sort of histories of uh, centuries of mass or the engineers have a good feel of what would happen in certain regimes. So we call that our prior information. And then we collect limited data to update our prior information to make more informed decisions. And this is a whole area, um, um, so you might guess if you know the field that I sound very like what's called a Bayesian. Uh, so it's uh, around, uh, stems from the area of Bayesian statistics, um, which have been sort of extended into probabilistic machine learning, is the process by how we make predictions in the sense we encapsulate expert opinion, our prior knowledge, we can have very little data, and then we make predictions which are, are updated given the evidence we see from observations, uh, but still capture kind of our uncertainty and our confidence in being able to make a prediction. Uh, and there's a sort of a whole other area of mass and, and, and sort of separate methods from the kind of big data where this is really important. Now, why this is so important is in all the areas where AI is going to be adopted in really safety critical areas, you really often either have limited data the reason with that is if you want to make predictions in extreme events that I want a plane to be safe under extreme conditions, it's a rare event. So by its nature, you don't have much data because you don't see it very often. And so methods that rely on huge amounts of data in these extreme cases aren't very helpful because you just can't collect data on extreme cases. And so there's an idea that for safety critical industries or where you make life or death decisions where you want to use these methods, 
you need methods that are robust to limited data, robust to noisy data, but also come with predictions or uncertainty measures that enable confidence in our ability to make a decision even with limited data. Um, and so that's a whole area of mass which kind of underpins our technology. Awesome. So, uh, so it's it's reasonably new to me, and and you know my maths level has been kind of applied maths in terms of physics um, and uh, and and that kind of stuff. So, I suppose a really basic uh, way to explain that, perhaps, could you give us a, a really kind of simple way? So, it's it's thinking about. Um, I'm just in particular. I'm trying to link it in with with how the AI works. So, I guess. We tend to think of AI as, you know, taking lots of data, trying to find connections between those data, uh, between that data. Sorry if you can hear all the cars driving past noisily outside. Um, so uh, the connections between the data and then trying to come up with, uh, you know, a, a kind of feedback loop of uh, inputs tested yep. out and 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 things like that. Can you link it in a little bit with that, just for people like me who who aren't that familiar with the the. Well, you can uh, imagine. So um, one of the pinning. Uh, technology that we have and there's actually a video on our LinkedIn with it's like an explainer about it that Anna did okay. from our company which is a really good one um, and so if you're interested um, that would be uh, it's another kind of longer video but I always describe it like um, you can imagine that um, before you've seen any data you might ask the question um, so imagine this is uh, so I think the example that she gives says okay what's the temperature going to be in Boston right and um, okay, um, you could Google uh, like what's the temperature going to be in Boston in, in autumn, and you could say, well, the average is going to be 22 degrees plus or minus that kind of amount, right? So we call this our prior information. We don't have any information specifically about what's happening in Boston now, but we have a kind of sensible human guess around what's a sensible temperature. A negative temperature in autumn is unlikely. 50 degrees is really unlikely. So we have this kind of idea of what we expect. So we call that our prior. Now we imagine that we've got a long trip and we go and fly to Seattle uh, and, uh, and then we're gonna do a road trip from Seattle to Boston, right? And um, so when we land in Seattle, we know the temperature in Seattle and that's, that's great. So it's maybe 18 degrees in Seattle. And then we say, well, actually how confident are we? If we know the temperature in Seattle, can we, how confident are we making about predictions in Boston? And we can observe, you know, from historic data, kind of an idea of how they, how likely it is you can be informed about what's happening in Boston based on knowing the temperature in Seattle. And you probably say, like, it's, it's about as informative as being here, right? Now, we take this slow journey from Seattle to Boston. Now, when I'm 10 miles outside of Boston, mm -hmm. and I say the temperature is 21 degrees, I'm pretty confident that the temperature is not 30 degrees or minus two in Boston. Mm -hmm. So this, this idea that I, un, I have this idea of correlation that as I collect data closer to where I'm making predictions, I can reduce my uncertainty in making those predictions in a kind of coherent way. Okay. So what this underpinning technology does is it really models this understanding of correlation and association between knowledge points. So if I know the temperature in Seattle, how much am I gonna believe the temperature in Boston? If I know it in Springfield, which I think 70 miles outside of Boston, I'm much more confident about making predictions. And so you're just honest about how you, how comfortable you are about, it's called extrapolating or interpolating between your data, uh, which classic um, machine learning technology doesn't. So neural networks without kind of this ability um, are really poor at extrapolating away from where they've seen data. They BS a lot, right? So, <laughs> right. Really, that's fine because how can you make predictions away from where you've collected data? Okay, you could use models, but really you just want to be honest when you make predictions that I'm really uncertain because I, I'm, I'm really stretching my knowledge of what might happen in Boston if I'm kind of making predictions from Seattle. So it's more about being a framework of decision making where you respect and be honest about your ability to infer uh, information that you're not fully certain about. Okay, awesome. Uh, that's really, really interesting, and uh, yeah, I still need to needs to percolate a little bit. Uh, but um, yeah, really, really interesting. And I, I, I'm conscious of the time, and I just want to kind of nudge people to to get in any last questions that you might want to ask Tim uh, before we wrap up. Um, and I think while they hopefully when when we get another question through. I just want to go into fusion energy a little bit because it's that kind of, you know, silver bullet potentially of, of, you know, if we can get fusion energy working, it might just uh, 
well, it won't solve, solve all the, the world's problems, but at least it'll solve the kind of energy uh, uh, abundance issue. Um, could you tell us a little bit about more, a bit more about that project and how that works? So we, um, we have a five-year partnership with UK AEA, which is kind of the government uh, atomic energy agency, which is kind of really driving research and fusion power. Um, they're a you know, public organization. They're very supportive of the supply chain um, to try and make us world leaders uh, in, in uh, fusion generally, but in like lots of different particular areas where the UK has uh, particular skills. Um, and so, yeah, extremely exciting area. It's... Um, I must say, like, I, I, we've now got two fusion experts in the business, which has really helped us uh, because we need them because it's really complicated. And my knowledge is pretty limited. But someone described this sort of describe it as, um, well, like trying to put a sun in a bottle. Um, but, and so, I mean, please, fusion people, don't quote me badly wrong. But the, the temperature is something like can be 100 million degrees in the center of a, a tokamak. And then the, gr the gradients of the outside, which might be a few meters, is like you know you know cold very cold and so this is one of the steepest gradients of temperature in the universe right and uh and they're trying to control this with massive magnets to bang neutrons together to produce energy and it sounds wonderfully sci-fi uh and but you know people are doing it and uh, there are lots of uh different experiments around the uk and in europe and huge growth in the us uh where this technology is really advancing what i love about it is it's this kind of uh, landing someone on the moon pursuit like it's really hard um, and even if it takes a while so everyone sort of says oh it's always 30 years away but kind of the debris of tech solutions you get by trying to solve this problem is amazing like so people have generated laser technology and then they've pivoted their business model to provide cancer treatment uh, they, they, you know so actually just getting the minds together and solving a really hard engineering physics and sort of commercial problem simultaneously has loads of huge side benefits not only in fusion but yeah our primary aim is it's limited data it's very big models uh and and how are people going to make decisions to say what's the most important driving faction uh sort of factor to get um to get fusion on the grid um so yeah wonderful project so, yeah. so exciting yeah really and and uh, i noticed the the comment here uh from linkedin user again it might be you again john uh perhaps uh that nuclear fusion energy is always attractive but it's it's been 20 years away for at least 50 years um the last 50 years but you know that was 50 years without ai so perhaps uh AI and uh, I mean, thinking there are this way. really wonderfully ambitious, uh, you, know, pro you know, projections of how quickly it can get on the grid. I, I you know, it's it's extremely hard, and uh, and it's, um, but I mean, it's there's amazing science behind it, and mm. I think you know if that misses kind of the benefits that we get from these mm. kind of suits. Um, you know, the UK, the effect on um, supporting businesses, like so, DigiLab do. Um, probably 60% of our work comes in, in the fusion space, which is really underpinned by government funding into these large projects. So, uh, which then funds, you know, part funds a tech company in the Southwest, which means people in the Southwest get good jobs, which yeah. means jobs do well. And, you know, like the benefits of, of this kind of um, pursuit is, yeah. is not direct and, yeah. and it's really meaningful. Yeah, we absolutely need more funding in the sciences generally, you know, and it's it's kind of sad that it's, you know, especially if you have more uh, indirect subjects, uh, you know, that maybe aren't cancer research, or well, obviously we should be funding that. Um, but, but you know, there are lots of other things which don't have that, that real tangible output. But like you say, there are lots of ways that things can be used uh, as a result of that. So yeah, we need more funding in sciences. The science yeah, is we have a bit of a joke. We have a bit of a joke in DigiLab because we have a high density of astrophysicists, right? And uh, and so like between the combination of fusion and, and sort of machine learning and data science, we're like we're um sort of uh, we're a social service to provide future jobs for astrophysicists, like because ultimately you need something quite grounded that's not up in the stars. So they say there's all the sort of people that their, their passion is in sort of exploratory uh, like space science. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, you know, we find a sort of a, a job down on earth for them. I think. Right. Nice. Uh, you know, to kind of harnessing a star in a bottle, yeah. effectively. Right. Yeah, sweet spot. Awesome. Yeah. 
That's great. Really great. And I think that's that's a really nice thing to to, to finish up on. So uh, so any, if we have any more questions, I suppose, Tim, would you be happy if we were to pass those on to you to, to answer uh, at some point? I know you're super busy yeah. running this oh, amazing okay. company. But. Or, or chat them on LinkedIn if there's anything, you know, great. I shall answer them openly. Great. fantastic thing. yeah brilliant so um a huge thank you to tim for uh, for all your time and these really inspiring uh, insights um and uh, and thank you all as well for tuning in uh, so we're hoping to continue this series throughout the uh, throughout the year um and hopefully in future as well, because we think it's a really nice way to connect people with the amazing research and industry going on in the region, which is partly why we exist. Um, and also to think about, you know, the, the connections to global issues. Uh, there are some really fantastic projects like you've heard today, thinking about how we can make a difference in, uh, for, for global issues um, and, and tackling them uh, collectively, whether that's, you know, uh, doing, choosing a career that enables you to work in something, uh, something really significant, um, or whether it's in, in the way you live you, or work um, and the way you influence other people. So, uh, so yeah, really, hopefully we'll, we'll have some really even, uh, you know, future chats as well on different areas of science. If you have uh, any suggestions about, you know, who we should speak to or topics you like us to investigate please pop that in the chat as well um but yeah thank you all so much for for tuning in and for your comments um and thanks again for tim uh for for joining us so uh thank you very much for for tuning in <laughs>